Guys, YouTube is the land of iconic duos. Cody Ko and Noah Miller, Grand Thumb and Macaulay Culkin, and of course, Zach and Mike. This is their latest campfire story, Pipeline of Avulsion. Let's get into it. It's time we talked about the pipeline survey job. We could talk about that. It could also be folded into a greater discussion about terrible jobs we've taken and how much we expected our employers to look out for us, which we have learned over 20 years is almost certainly never the case. Yes, yes. Really quick recap. I enlisted in the military in 2004. I got out of the military in 2009. 2009 through 2013, I was going to college for technical writing. My dream job was to get a job teaching or writing about small arms repair, writing for a gun magazine, something along those lines. You Guys, this is a pretty typical trajectory for a lot of military folks. A lot of them will get out and go to college. That's because, of course, military service grants you the GI Bill, which allows veterans access to a very large college fund basically in which they get a large portion of their tuition paid for as well as living expenses it's one of the most effective ways to of course fund your college especially in this day and age where the alternative is tremendous student loans that will take you a decade to pay off this is effectively prepaying your student loans while still working a job the other option that I took is, of course, to go to college on an ROTC scholarship, in which case you finish college, but you have to do concurrent military courses, basically, and some training in the summers, and you commission as an army officer upon graduation. And they will pay for your entire college with comparable levels of benefits to the GI Bill but you have to serve either in the reserve or national guard as an officer or on active duty as an officer all in all it's a pretty good deal especially if once you finish your four years of commitment as an officer you begin to accrue gi bill benefits and that's why i stayed in an additional 18 months past my uh, minimum required service date is because those even just 18 months of accrued gi bill benefits meant that about 50 percent or more of my tuition at my graduate program was paid for you wanted to combine your two interests of writing and also fixating on guns yes so i was going to college for technical writing and then one day one of the people I knew in the military gets a hold of me and says, hey, I am now teaching small arms repair to the U.S. military as a civilian at Fort Lee in Virginia. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, hell yeah, that sounds awesome. How do I get that gig? So I applied. I got the job almost immediately. It paid $27 an hour. Quite nice, I think. Yeah. This didn't require a degree. Nope, didn't require a degree. They offered me the job like immediately. So I dropped out of college my last year. <laughs> I barely started my last year of college. I was like maybe two weeks in. Mm -hmm. Dropped out of college, dropped everything, moved to Virginia, started teaching small arms repair. Since you had already started that semester, did you get your money back? No. <laughs> you spent an entire year's tuition and didn't attend. No, just an entire semester's tuition. Still a lot. Yeah. Also, it wasn't my money. It was the GI Bill's money. <laughs> well, it's easier to throw that away then. Uh, but I had to pay that back. Ah. Uh, so, yes. yeah. Yeah, this is one of the tough things in a lot of job markets, right? These decisions can be really hard when you have to choose between working and finishing school. The math is what economists call an opportunity cost. An opportunity cost means that the cost of choosing A is B. So a lot of people think that, oh, maybe he saved money by not attending college or he lost money by attending that if he had attended that last year. And that's the idea of an opportunity cost. A lot of people just think to themselves, oh, job X pays me, uh, let's say $20,000 more a year. Well, the opportunity cost of that is maybe things that are intangible like work-life balance or a shorter commute or even just safer better working conditions so we have to think both economically in terms of pure money and 
but also in in non-monetary terms those are also opportunity costs so a good example would be the opportunity cost he passed up was to be able to get a degree in 12 months in contrast the opportunity cost of of course going to small arms repair school was actually not that much because he, it was only one semester's tuition because obviously that's all he gave up so the math would actually look different if this was an offer on his at his freshman year but because he was almost finished his schooling it may not have been the best call but in 2009 27 dollars an hour was an awesome job and probably as good or better than most college graduates then were making if you know from other videos i've talked a lot about what it was like to graduate college in 2009 and i will tell you that i was so lucky to be able to transition immediately onto the active duty military which sounds bananas for somebody to say how lucky they were to get roped into the military and have to go to war but the economy for young college grads in 2009 was just so bad that $27 an hour would have been a godsend. Most of the time, I think you were, you, to give you an idea, I had friends that would do things like substitute teach a day or two a week. Uh, others, one of my friends worked as a, uh, basically for a catering company. He would set up tables um, prior to big events at a hotel for, I think it was like $9 an hour. The, the economy was just a train wreck. And these were college graduates, a lot of whom now work in fairly high level professional jobs. So it's just a testament to how bad things were and how juicy it must have looked to get such a desirable job offer before you even graduated. That's one of the reasons that I still have student loans now is because I have to pay that back. The semester you didn't I attend. I dropped out, yeah. Dropped out, moved to Virginia. Long story short, basically Congress deemed a bunch of budget cuts had to happen and they reduced the amount of civilian contractors there were. And you were unfortunately one of the ones were cut. And I was one of the ones that got cut. So 2014, I find myself living in Virginia, separate from literally everyone I've ever known. Mm. I have one friend in Virginia who now has moved somewhere else because he also lost a job teaching small arms repair. So back down to zero friends in Virginia, effectively became homeless. Wait, really? Yeah, I, I, I had like nothing. I couldn't afford to pay rent because I had lost my job. So I I, I rented a, a U-Haul truck and then just lived in the back of that. I wasn't aware of this part. How long did that last? Uh, two weeks. Okay. Not yeah. terrible, but still. I mean, I just want to point out that living in a U-Haul truck for two weeks is considered not terrible. Guys, if there's one thing that I have learned when you talk to entrepreneurs creators anybody that's really achieved a level of success they can point to a time where they thought they were donezo where i mean by definition right everyone whose life has an up and a down will have some lowest point and certainly things can always uh, get worse but being broke jobless and living out of a u-haul is a pretty rough feeling um you know obviously i don't know if i've had a bunch but I definitely uh, always harken back to when I left grad school, I didn't really have a job. I had applied to 80 different places and I ran out of money. Uh, I needed, I spent my last 950 on a my rent payment and I wasn't really sure where the next one was going to come from. And so I, of course, my parents were always like, you can always come back home and figure things out. But when you're almost 30, that doesn't sound like a great prospect. I really wasn't sure what I was gonna do. And I got so lucky to have landed a job uh, making half of what I made in the military uh, with my old employer, the, de uh, I guess I can put this out now, the Department of Homeland Security. And lucky for me, I really enjoyed the job the they paid me promptly so i was actually able to make rent and i ended up advancing pretty quickly and within about three years was making more than i was uh in, on active duty but it was a, it was a tough time and i was broke for a lot of that and yeah i always kind of you always have to go back to those times um when times get tough in the present living out of the back of a u-haul yeah i uh, this is this is one of the ways that i discovered that if you want hot food and you're homeless what you can do is just take your car battery 
and then go buy a crock pot from Goodwill for like five bucks and then just snip the electrical plug on the back of the crock pot, strip the two wires and then attach them to the car battery and it heats the crock pot up. <laughs> okay. So that's how you can make hot food if you don't, if all you have is a car battery and a crock pot. You know, you know, you can just use the cigarette lighters inside the car to achieve the exact same effect. Yeah. The, the, he, he, okay. So fun fact. One, people hem and haw about van life this and van life that. I don't know how to tell you this, but people have already solved the van life problem using RVs. If you haven't seen RVs and campers, that's what they are. If you have to live out of a car, you should look to what campers do. And oftentimes you can buy extremely inexpensive butane burners. You get a little rocket stove, you screw it on, and it'll heat up your meals. Heat up some water, heat up a pot of soup. Right there, you can do it in the cab of a car. It's very easy. You can do it in a tent. That's what they're designed for. Another option is, of course, to use the car's cigarette lighter to power small appliances, which it often can. Some cars even nowadays have actual 9-volt inputs that you can plug in small appliances to, and they will, they will run. So there's a lot of options out there. The other piece of advice that I've never had to utilize, but I've heard is very, very useful, is places like Planet Fitness and LA Fitness. Those are extremely low cost gyms, which are not great fitness areas, but they are awesome because they have showers. And for $10 a month, you can get access to a shower, a fitness center, and then you just have to, of course, find a laundromat for laundry, and you're able to pretty effectively live out of a car. Why did you never tell me about this? Why were you suffering in silence? Uh, because I was embarrassed. Anyway, one of my friends from high school got a hold of me. We were talking about something, and he basically was like, yeah, I got this job doing pipeline survey. It's really great. Uh, right now, they have me working on a bridge. Yeah, does, a, does a pipeline cross the bridge? No, it was... The job was a cathodic protection job. We refer to it as the pipeline survey job because that's better than a cathodic protection installation job. And what they were doing is using this thing that's like a combination of an arc welder and a spray paint gun to literally metalize and spray zinc <laughs> in patches onto the concrete that you then wire to the rebar inside of the concrete. So that that rusts instead of the rebar inside. Because when the rebar inside starts rusting, it starts causing spalling, which means that the concrete cracks and starts fragmenting all over the place. It, it obviously compromises the integrity of the bridge. Basically, what he was doing was adding like 25 to 30 years of life to this concrete. He was spray painting metal on the bridge so that the spray painted metal rusts. Yes, exactly. Anyway, he's uh, like, yeah, it's, it's a great job. It's paying like... $30 an hour, mm -hmm. and you're getting prevailing wage, and you're getting Minnesota painter's wages. It was paying a stupid amount of money to do this job. And he was like, it's great. I'm basically the only person out here. I don't have to, like, report to other people. No one's There's, breathing down your back. Nobody's breathing down your back. You get to spend all day outside. Oh, it's so In Minnesota, did we, did we, are we just going to ignore this? Doing, being outdoors in the cold is its own animal and if you i've done more than a couple of very very cold uh training events that were weeks long in the military it sucks i've done more than a couple videos if you look at mhgr my other channel if you look at those old videos you see i had more than a couple of winter camp experiences that were experiences so it is really punishing to be outdoors in the cold it's oh, like nice. it's hard work but it's great I was like, man, that sounds awesome. And he, he, he basically said, you know, we need another person. So do you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, I don't have a job. I, I don't, don't have, have a college a degree. I'm homeless. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, fine. I'll fucking do it. Yeah. Because at this point, what I was waiting on while I was still living in Virginia is I was waiting on my Merchant Mariner credential and my TWIC card, which is Transportation Workers Identification Credential, so that I could get a job working on a tugboat. <laughs> if things had changed a little differently... If time had run its course a little differently, you could have been operating a tugboat. Yeah, I would have moved to Norfolk, Virginia and been working on a tugboat. And by now, I probably would have been a tugboat captain. <laughs> well, because I have a high degree of mechanical inclination, 
And I was like, you know, working on a tugboat might be kind of cool. I found the Guys, a tugboat is actually a extremely high skill job. That's because as you know, the tugboats guide large container ships into ports. Ports, of course, are very idiosyncratic. Rock formations, currents, all sorts of different things can affect the movement of a ship. And so instead of having every single container ship captain get briefed in detail on all the idiosyncrasies of every single port they might have to land, it's more convenient to have a small cadre of experts who know that individual port inside and out who operate tugboats who are experts at just pulling and guiding these large container ships into port for offloading. Plus, it allows them to also it, it control better traffic into and out of the port since the ships know just if they don't see a tugboat, they don't need to enter port. I'm not a naval uh, expert and I'm definitely not a maritime port expert. So if I'm missing something, let me know in the comments. I'm the phone number of a tugboat place and I called them and I was like, yo, do you need any workers? And they're like, what, do you, what can you do? Well, I can fix small engines. I can kind of work on diesel engines. I know how to work on hydraulic systems. And they're like, yeah, we can use another engineer. Just get this stuff and then get back to us. <laughs> but because unfortunately, uh, it ended up taking like four months for me to get my Merchant Mariner credential. Mm. Um, so I would have been homeless for quite a while in Virginia before I actually... Anyway, you took the pipeline job instead. Took the cathodic protection job instead. What it originally was, was two weeks on, one week off. Okay. That was the original schedule. I would work for two weeks, and then I would have an entire week off. And then go back to work for two weeks, and then have an entire week off. Okay. And, like, it was great at first. When I showed up there to do this pipeline survey job, I had, you know, my steel-toed boots. I did have to go get some other boots because the steel-toed boots I was wearing were literally steel-toed combat boots. <laughs> and they were the jungle combat boots. Yeah. If you've never been to a bunch of construction sites, usually they are very wet and very muddy. Because yep. you're moving a lot of heavy equipment around that's just churning up the ground. No grass to absorb. Yep, this was actually a huge problem in World War One Because as much as the equipment would churn up the ground... So so what's happening is without any vegetation to kind of hold the mud in place and absorb some of the water, the water and mud just mix together and form, well, uh, uh, mud, an even more difficult to navigate mud. It's almost like quicksand, right? If you've ever stepped in really deep mud, the way it can grip your shoe and form suction and your foot will come out of your shoe before your shoe comes out of the mud. That's sort of the effect that this can have. When you're talking about fields and fields stripped of its vegetation and churned up like he's talking about, it can make just traversing the area really difficult. In World War I, it wasn't even just machines doing this, it was artillery fire and lots of it. So you would have miles and miles of mud, sometimes meters thick, that would just simply suck up everything that fell into it. Supposedly, in some of the worst battlefields, there would be soldiers who would get trapped in the mud, whose units would leave them behind, and people had orders to be at the front, and there was no time to pull these people out. So they would simply get have people walk past them. Similarly, horses would get caught there and slowly sucked into the mud. It was, by all accounts, an actual sort of hellscape. Absorb it. I almost kind of got trench foot the first couple days, but you know, whatever, <laughs> it's fine. A we'll story for another day. Story for another time. Like you know what you know, bobcats, the little bucket loader things. Okay. They're, they're generally called like skid steer or a bobcat or whatever. You oh, okay. Can call them whatever you want. Anyway, we had one of those, but it didn't have a cockpit. You would stand behind it and walk behind it as it moved itself along. Okay. So basically like a lawnmower only with tracks <laughs> okay. and a little lift thing on the front. Mm -hmm. We named it Sheila <laughs> okay. because it had tank treads. Uh, um, there were I, I, I don't see the connection, but okay. Multiple points where like we would have to drive it through water that was almost knee deep. So we would sit on the top of it and reach behind us to operate <laughs> the controls. Yeah, if you've ever been on a real construction site, you see that all of those OSHA regulations quickly become suggestions in the face of reality. That said, you don't want to be the person who is supervising while someone gets hurt doing something stupid like this. Because OSHA's nowhere around, so what do they care? Uh-huh. So, so the thing would be basically submerged? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just little, this little tiny diesel-powered thing is just going, <laughs> just 
wading through mud because it's got a it's got a snorkel so it can breathe. I didn't realize you were doing construction on Atlantis. Because this was a bridge and it was going over effectively swampland, oh. there were several parts where it was the mud was quite deep. Mm -hmm. Okay, the way they solve this problem in, for example, the Ford operating bases I was at, or in World War One, was to use basically just pallets pallets and wood planks laid across the mud to form walkways that sort of sat above the mud and allowed things that were as long as they weren't too terribly heavy could cross with relative ease i imagine that this this machine could probably benefit from just some planks laid down so like Another solution is, of course, to use pumps to find the low points where water pools and just run a pump at the beginning of the day to manage the water from getting too deep in that area. Then just have the water spray out somewhere back into the swamp where there isn't construction going on. Like starting out, the job was great. I had like zero complaints about it. Mm. It went incredibly well. Uh, like I enjoyed doing it. It was good. That bridge assignment lasted about a month. Yeah, I think it was about a month. And then it was on to other jobs. And then it was, that is when it started getting into the survey portion of the job. Working with actual pipelines. Yeah. So what this job would entail. So I'm just going to point this out. 2009, there were two things that were probably facil. Well, no, this was in 2015. So, okay, I might be wrong. My understanding was that back in 2009, there was a huge surge in oil prices. And it was one of the only industries where things were going well is we had to apply the same cathodic protection systems to other pipelines. Mm. And a lot of it either involved just doing like the standard standard anodes where you basically just slap a chunk of zinc onto the pipeline or installing rectifiers, which is a thing that converts alternating current into direct current. And the way a rectifier cathodic protection wor system works, it, it, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares. It's all very complex. It's all very complex. Basically, you take a thing that converts AC current to DC current, and it pumps electricity into the pipeline, which makes it last longer mm -hmm. somehow. I don't fully know. But anyway... He's probably talking about something my guess would be similar to electrolysis, which is where, of course, if you've ever seen it done, it's usually done in a fluid of some kind, and it's where they do electroplating, which somehow through a sort of magnetism, right, all the atoms of one substance exposed to the water will draw out the atoms of another substance. Usually in jewelry, for example, it'll be a cheap metal like tin, and they'll use the electrolysis and the water suspension to draw out these gold atoms and create an, a, an atoms thick layer of gold around the outside of the chain giving it the appearance of gold but in fact it's just some cheap metal i did a lot of work this is why when you see 24 karat gold plated uh that's because of course the gold atoms are pure gold that's what's being extracted from the solution so it's 24 karat but it is a few atoms thick uh just a, as close to nothing as you can get work in the rust belt area mm -hmm. of the united states how ironic now what the job entails is either getting readings on a pipeline to see what condition it's in or directly installing cathodic protection systems and as I remember, the measurement portion generally consisted of taking some kind of rod and marching around with that, trying to yeah. follow it. You had these two things that looked like ski poles. <laughs> they had little sensors in them, and you had to pour liquid in them for some reason. I forget exactly why. I don't fully understand how it worked. Basically, you would hook a current up to the pipeline. It would make the pipeline emit a frequency that you would use this rod thing to locate where the pipeline is. You basically had a metal detector that not only detected the pipeline, but also told you how much charge it had to make sure it was in good condition. Yeah. To, something like that. Something along those lines. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things that's illustrating kind of a larger principle about our world is that people vastly underestimate how complex, even seemingly simple things can be, right? The classic example is, of course, the construction outside the major interstate highway near your house. Everybody's got one and everybody knows what I'm talking about the construction project that just never ends Well, this is just a small example of what sort of complicates these things because of course you can imagine that under those highways is not only the uh, more highway substructure, but things like internet cables water cables 
power lines, sewage lines, all sorts of utilities crisscrossed for different neighborhoods, different areas, for different industrial applications. All sorts of stuff is under these roadways. In addition to that, they're highly regulated environments, so you need to have permits to dig so deep or so far. Or, or uh, sometimes in order to move a cable, you will have to actually dig in someone's house on someone else's property. So the legal wrangling, the logistical wrangling, the technical work required to do even simple things like a bridge Right? There's so much more beneath the surface. And this is true of almost every system, which is why if someone can explain to you in like 15 minutes or a few sound bites what is going on and what the problem is, you should not trust them unless it starts with, well, it's really complicated, but I'm going to try to simplify it. All right, this is when you talk to any lawyer, the joke is always when you ask them a legal question about their area of expertise, they always say, well, it depends, it's complicated. And that's because it's true of basically everything. The world is a very, very, very complicated place. And it needs a lot of different specialists to do things to keep running. As you can see, maintaining bridges to be safe to operate is an extremely complicated business and these guys are just one subset of that industry so you had this thing that you would attach to your chest on like a weird harness system basically like a freaking graphing calculator that was slightly more advanced <laughs> yeah that you would connect that to these two ski poles that you had and you would walk on top of roughly where the pipeline is and every time you stuck one of the ski poles into the ground you would push the button on top of it and it would go beep and it would measure the current coming off the pipeline mm. or whatever. You have to have basically a contact point with the soil to do it. So if the pipeline goes under a road or a driveway or a pond or a lake, if it's a short distance, eh, whatever. Mm -hmm. If it's a lake, you can't really go through the lake. There was, I remember doing one job that I don't think you were here for just yet, but this pipeline went all over the place under like a mall parking lot. Oh my. So every six feet, we had to take a drill and drill through the through the asphalt or asphalt of the of the parking lot and then well thankfully there's no malls left anymore if you've ever seen the dead malls youtube channel it's fun and sort of spooky just wild to think that a generation ago you know when my mom was my age the mall was the social and commercial hub of a town it was where all the good stores were located it was where you would go for your friends being close to the mall was being close to civilization now of course there's almost no brick and mortar retail the only things that they still sort of do brick and mortar are things that you have to see or assess in person to understand like clothing or food and even that isn't really that necessary anymore in the era of grocery delivery uh, with the exception of course of your produce you may want to put eyes on that i've been burned more than a couple times by uh, whole foods grocery pickers and then pour water into the hole so that we could get a reading off of the pipeline so basically what this job what it turned into was me or somebody else walking along with the the measurement system going beep 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 every like six feet to mm. take a measurement someone else drilling holes in the concrete three feet apart from each other this every sounds, six feet this sounds ridiculous and then someone else pouring water in the holes with a bottle of water before you would get up to it so that you could take a measurement on it this mall was still intact right it was oh those... yeah it was still a functioning mall so we're doing this and there's like you have a belt that you have to wear with a pouch on the back of it that carries like two miles of copper wiring yes because the way this works is you have to be connected to the pipe to measure it yes and it's all very very low voltage you don't have to worry about it no i like never got shocked you. by it or anything um i did but we'll get into that in a minute <laughs> okay so when you get done surveying osha just slacking man being a thing you have to go pick up all this copper wiring and the copper wiring is very thin it's about the thickness of a human hair but it's like miles of this copper wiring because you would do sections like a mile long mm -hmm. in between where the like the survey points are the survey points are like a mile long so you gotta go back and pick up all that copper wire also this copper wire because it's so thin 
There were multiple times where we would have to cross a road and then a car would drive across that copper wire. The copper wire would immediately snap. Or my personal favorite one, where the copper wire would get wrapped around the axle of the car <laughs> and the car would just pull all like two miles of your copper wire. So you're just walking along and suddenly you like stop for a second and it's really quiet and you hear... <laughs> you're like, what is that noise? And you look behind oh you and see the copper wire is going... <laughs> Shooting out, <laughs> shooting out of it, shooting out of your pack, and you're like, "Oh fuck!" So then you gotta snap it off. Mm. You don't have to worry about it getting wrapped around your hand or anything. There's no danger in it. It just means that now you have like two hours of work. You have to go back, find where the wire snapped. Mm -hmm. It just sucks. Yeah. I mean, the survey portion, honestly, for as much as we complain about it, it wasn't that bad. You were walking around holding ski poles for hours. It's really easy work for decent pay. For decent pay, and most of the time, you're outside. And it's generally relatively nice out, because you can't do this job in the winter or the rain. Yep, that is something that you've probably also noticed at the construction near your interstate, is that you really can't safely do these jobs in rain or in the winter. Yeah, people sometimes joke in the Northeast that there is winter and construction season. If it's a rainy day, congratulations, you're getting paid to stay indoors. Pretty much, yeah. The other part of the job was inspecting cathodic protection systems that had already been installed or had been there before. So basically you would have to go up to one of these rectifiers, this thing that's converting AC current to DC current. Mm. You would have to go up to this thing and take measurements off of it. That is how I accidentally took uh, 750 milliamps directly across the chest. 7.5, not 750. I don't know if that's a lot. That could be a lot of milliamps or very few. What I did is I went up to a rectifier to get readings off of it. Hmm. Normally what you do is you hold the multimeter in one hand, you take the little alligator clip that's attached to the multimeter, and you go clip and clip one wire on, clip, clip the second wire on. Yep. All while only ever putting one hand onto the thing. Hmm. What I did... Be Shout out to Zach and Mike for either getting an editor or doing their own editing with new animations because i was in a hurry and impatient mm -hmm. as i walked up with the positive and negative wires in my right and left hand and went boop and put both of them on oh. at the same time because i didn't even think about it mm -hmm. did not even think about it at all <laughs> put them on there and the moment i attached them my hands went numb yep and my chest hurt really bad <laughs> and i oh. went ow that really hurts this was it was for such a imperceptibly short period of time. Mm -hmm. I immediately had to like sit down and I'm just like, oh, I feel sick. You just like, got electrocuted. <laughs> my whole chest hurt really bad. And shortly after doing this, I could feel and kind of hear my heartbeat going. Doo -doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds like a horrible way to go. And that sounds really scary. And it's, it, I mean, it's tough. It's so easy to be cavalier, but this is why the military loses its mind over safety culture, right? And sometimes it gets a little bit draconian and a little bit preposterous about doing everything the exact right way every single time. But it's because of this, you see, this was a, a, a organization with a company with a cavalier culture about safety. And when you have that, then you don't instill the discipline required to every time clip one clip two or the best way to do it is always clip with your right hand that way never clip with two hands at once one hand at a time so by definition you can never clip them both at the same time completing the circuit not great not great so it was 750 milliamps which is the point that can cause Severe heart palpitations, possible heart failure, extreme pain. Oh, you felt that. Hell yeah, I felt all those things because my heart didn't want to run correctly. Mm. So when you take that many milliamps of direct current, it's basically overriding the signal going from your brain to your heart, telling it how- Zach, Zach's ability to be almost killed in, in non-war zones is pretty astounding. The fact that he has very few instances of almost dying in the war zone and numerous instances of almost dying in the non-war zone is preposterous to me. How to be. Yeah, I had to figure it back out a couple seconds. Yeah, it, so it took a minute of my heart going, ah, oh God, what the fuck? Ah! <laughs> I basically spent the rest of the day feeling like absolute dog shit and feeling like I wanted to throw up. I believe that. I hit myself with AC current before. 
I, it wasn't pleasant, but I I moved on pretty quickly. DC Current, I wouldn't want to mess with that. The, the way I described it when I was working this job is alternating current lets you know you fucked up. Direct current grabs onto you and doesn't fucking let go until you are dead. Luckily, it was such a low amperage that it didn't just fucking kill me. Yes, that could have happened. I, this. Yeah, it, there's actually, I believe, one of the earlier videos was Thomas Edison trying to sell people on the dangers of his rival's direct current. And to do that, he electrocuted an elephant. If that seems almost comically inhumane, uh, it's because it sort of is. Thomas Edison was kind of well known for being a jerk. This is also how I realized that people just won't fucking do something if there isn't a law about it. Probably, yeah. And by, by people, I mean companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, for example, they called us out to do a survey on a pipeline. This pipeline went under a metro system, like a, a electric-powered train. Okay. And we're doing surveys on this pipeline. I forget what the exact numbers were. It doesn't matter. Let's just say that the numbers are supposed to be within 0.1 to point. Four. Okay. That's where the numbers should be. Mm -hmm. Every single time a train would pass over this pipeline, the current was spiking to like 6.4 <laughs> or like 8.5. And like this pipeline is not designed to and to have that much current going through it. Mm -hmm. This pipeline, it can maybe handle one volt going through it. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, yeah, do a survey on this pipeline. And we come back with these results of... Yeah, this pipeline might fucking explode. <laughs> yeah. You need to, like, get this looked at. Well, can you stall install one that'll just absorb the current? <laughs> no! No, we can't. You need to replace this whole fucking pipeline. Oh, uh, okay. Well, we'll, like, we'll put it in the budgetary meeting. What do you mean? <laughs> it's gonna fucking blow up! There would, there would be times we would show up, and some crotchety 60-year-old guy would be like, Yeah, go fix this pipeline. We're not supposed to fix it. We're just, like, looking at it. Yeah. We're just supposed to look at the pipeline. Well, I don't know where it is. Here's the charts of where all the pipelines are. This was done in 1920. Yep. That is how old a lot of the infrastructure under your major cities are. Our major cities. The major cities. It is ancient and... Because so much stuff has since been built on top of it, there is very little updates to be done. It is always worrying when you hear about this because it means that, of course, infrastructure will probably continue to fail at a pretty brisk rate. The classic one, when I lived in Washington, D.C. not too long ago, the metro system was always on fire. And by always on fire, I mean literally almost every day, some part of the system would catch fire and they would have to close multiple stations and hold up multiple trains. The problem is, is that when you have a very unreliable metro system, it becomes a, uh, it enters what is sometimes called a death spiral. And that's because if enough, let's say after a week or a month of routine delays, 1% of people, 1% of riders go, you know what? I can't trust the metro. This isn't a reliable means of transportation. I'm going to just start driving to work or taking the bus, which means, of course, that the metro has less money, right? 1% less, fewer riders. And then, therefore, they have less money to perform their routine maintenance. And so the result was, of course, a metro that had caught fire even more frequently, meaning that now, 2% of riders would say, forget this, I'm tired of these delays, I can't tolerate this. And they would start driving or riding the bus. And so it would progressively see ridership drop and drop and drop and drop. And it was a function of the fact, it wasn't, it was a function of the fact that maintenance was so bad. It wasn't the fact that, you know, that, oh, there's less riders, so we have more maintenance problems. That's kind of true, but we also have more maintenance problems because we have less riders. How do you not know where your own pipelines are going? <laughs> They've got like a state map, but it's like the old kind of state maps where like the state of Michigan is like smashed and smushed. Yeah, it's a state map from like the 1800s. <laughs> yeah. Back when Lewis and Clark were mapping it out. I, I am not joking. There were legitimately points where we showed up to do a survey on a pipeline. <laughs> and the last time a survey had been done was 1960 something. Mm-hmm. That was because that was the last time that the federal government said, hey, you probably want to check your pipelines. 
it was baffling to me that like our infrastructure could be that completely fucked. It is. Yeah. It's so screwed. Like there's places where natural gas is being delivered to houses. The natural gas pipeline is still made out of fucking lead. <laughs> we can't get. Yeah, it is actually worrying to live in some of those older areas. Did you know that officially you children are not supposed to play in the dirt of parks in most major cities. And that is because up until the 1970s or 80s, leaded gasoline would emit clouds of lead over cities that would then come back down and settle in the soil. And the lead, of course, remains in those soils, meaning that children who play and don't wash their hands thoroughly, right, in parks and dirt, they will get lead poisoning from that contamination, low-grade lead poisoning. As you know, lead exposure in children is known to reduce IQ, increase instances of ADHD and other uh, neurological disorders. It's just a really dangerous thing to be exposed to. And of course, the governments of your city and probably has it on a website somewhere where almost no one can bothers to look for it a reading off the pipeline mm. and it's metal it's a metal pipeline so it's just a lead pipeline something yeah there were there were a lot of places that to their credit they were like yeah we need you to get a reading off this pipeline so that we can replace it with plastic because like we cannot have it be made out of metal mm. so there are some there are some people that are responsible there are some companies that are actually being somewhat responsible about it sometimes their feet are being held to the fire we did run into some very interesting things. Um, there was one time we got shot at while we were uh, doing this. Okay, guys, b before we get into the shot at story, I, I, we are already at 41 minutes. This has been a pretty wild story so far. I'm learning things about Zach that I didn't really even know. So, it, yeah, let me know if you want me to continue this deep dive into this one of the deepest campfire stories yet deep into the zach and mike uh lore i'm digging it but be sure to follow me on twitch right i'm streaming there all the time not all the time i have a schedule you can find it on twitch twitch.tv slash combat paul link is in the description and until next time i'll see you guys later